Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Rainy Washington morning, but nonetheless, a sunny day inside. Welcome. Uh, my name is Tim Shriver. I am the co-chair of the National Commission family. Uh, on behalf of my fellow co-chairs, Linda Darling-Hammond and Governor John Engler, I get the chance to do the now three minutes of welcome that will precede <laughs> this uh, very, very extraordinary, really historic day. Um, I'm also uh, standing here as the chair of the board of CASEL, the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, whose CEO is here somewhere. I think, oh, there she is, Karen Nimi. And uh, I mentioned CASEL today because in some ways uh, I feel like what has been accomplished in this room by this group of people is so powerfully uh, the hope and the dream of the team that con constitutes the broader collaborative for academic, social, and emotional learning. We're here uh, really for a celebration. I want to thank Jackie uh, Jodel, our new and extraordinary uh, chief executive. Can, can we give Jackie an, a hand for pulling together <clears throat> her entire team? Most recently, I think many of you, if not all of you, were on the virtual site visit to Nashville many before the site visits to Cleveland and so on. Uh, the, the team has just ex exceeded, I think, our wildest expectations for what could be accomplished uh, in this field at this particular moment in time. The, uh, Karen said to me, does this feel like a wedding? Um, so that would be the groom's side, right? This would be the bride's side. Apparently the bride is more popular. I don't know if that's social and this is emotional or which side is coming together. But it's probably a, a, a new form of marriage, a marriage of threes, if that's possible. I don't think we've got that yet in our contemporary lexicon. But uh, this extraordinary report by Stephanie Jones uh, is a celebration of a coming together the likes of which many people, even in this room, might have thought was impossible as recently as 12 or 18 months ago. Roger famously said at a, Roger Weisberg at a meeting here, I think two years ago, that getting scholars to agree on scientific issues was less likely than getting them to agree to share their toothbrushes. <laughs> but here we have it done. Uh, he did really say that. <laughs> it's kind of gross. It's kind of gross, but he did say it. <laughs> uh, but here we have it done. Uh, we have this extraordinary text in front of us that I personally believe, and I think many of you share the belief, will be a seismic shifter uh, of the future of uh, education in the United States. It represents not just distinguished scientists, although the convening we have today is of distinguished scientists. It represents partners. It represents funders. It represents parents. It represents young people. It represents educators. It represents policy leaders. It represents the commission. It represents thought leaders at the grassroots and thought leaders at the grass tops around this country. It gives us the chance which, as I said before, many people thought we would never get, which is to create a unified field. I believe that uh, if there were an edit, and I asked Stephanie how many people really got into the editing, and she said there were a few of you <laughs> who were very, very difficult. Um, I wasn't one of them, but I'm going to do a post hoc edit. Uh, because to me, one of the most exciting sentences in this text uh, reads as follows. By uniting a broad alliance of leaders, to speak with a unified voice about the urgency of integrating social and emotional development into the fabric of K-12 education. This commission is uniquely positioned to highlight critical scholarship at a time, and here's my edit, at a time when the nation's future depends on creating a new generation committed to a more inclusive and welcoming and just future for this country. Uh, we are finishing the summer of Charlottesville. We all know where we are in the history of this country. We all know how fragile uh, the, the bond that unites us is right now. <clears throat> and if we think about who will, where will, how can we tilt the balance, tilt this fragile balance toward a more unified and inclusive future for all of our children, who will do that? Uh, I personally would say I would have limited confidence that it will come from politics, limited confidence that it will come from the media, 
little confidence that it will come from Hollywood, little confidence that it will come from almost any institution other than schools, <clears throat> that the only real chance we have uh, to tilt this fragile balance, this moment in time, towards the kind of inclusive and just and competitive and unified future that we, I think, in this room share a belief in, the only shot we have is with our young people and with our schools and with our educators. I think there are frontline soldiers uh, to combat where we, uh, uh, the negative forces that are around us and to create the positive possibilities that we all believe are here. So this document, in my view, positions us not just to unite scholars, not just to identify the next big hurdle in scholarship, which may be, uh, to return to Stephanie's work, the taxonomy, the taxonomy that we all agree on. We didn't get, we got, we got basic science at some level that we agree on. Maybe someday we'll have a taxonomy that we agree on. But we can now create a research agenda that is cutting edge that we could agree on. We can now create frameworks for practice that are cutting edge that we can agree on. We can now create a unified voice for policy change that we can agree on. We have the foundation. We can reference it, we can use it, and we can mobilize with it. So in some ways, this team has now signed off on the foundational document that will allow us to use our influence collectively uh, to move the national conversation in a way that I think not only benefits children, but benefits the country. So you might say, can research do all this? My answer would be, I don't think anything other than research can set the foundation necessary to move the country and to move schools. If we don't have the evidence base, particularly in this field, if we don't have a rigorous evidence-based research alignment, we don't have a field. And if we do have it, we have a field. And if we have a field, we have the hope of change. So with that, I want to say on behalf, I think, of everybody here, a huge thanks to Stephanie and her collaborators. Yeah. If this were a room full of kids, we'd have some hoot hoots and some all that kind of stuff. But it is scientists, so we have to be a little bit uh, <laughs> happy uh, with what we've got. Um, but my job now is to introduce the first panel that Stephanie is going to moderate. As you all know, Stephanie is the Mar Marie and Max Kargman Associate Professor in Human Development. Is that still the right title? I was going to say, I don't think so. Full professor. Yeah, baby, full professor. Um, she's going to moderate the panel, and I'll just introduce you. You, you all know everyone, uh, each other here. Camille Farrington is going to come up, uh, who's uh, at the University of Chicago Consortium on School Research. Mary Helen Mordino yang is coming up, who's a professor at USC. Maurice Elias, who is a professor at Rutgers. Oscar Barberin, who is a professor at the University of Maryland College Park. And Stephanie, with those names and that leadership and this extraordinary moment, I hand the podium to you. Stephanie Jones! <laughs> All I can think is, uh, why didn't Roger say that to me? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> and I hope someone took notes on, on what Tim just said. Can we just reprint the whole thing? <laughs> OK. Um, thank you. I'm very happy to be here. And truly, this whole, this, my whole career, this brief, was a labor of love. Um, and it was not uh, a singular achievement. It was really this entire group. And the scholars, not only the group actively working on the brief, but the scholarship that this group has produced is the foundation of this work. So uh, I find that incredibly exciting. Um, my job, if I can see the slides, I'll just make sure they're working, is to do three things. OK, so I'm going to just tell you a tiny bit of the story of uh, how this went down. Um, and then I'm going to give you a very brief summary of the brief itself. I'm not going to reiterate it completely, because you can read it. Um, but I am going to talk a little bit about the big questions that I think have, uh, have been floating around in our field for a while, and, and say quickly what the consensus is uh, about those questions. And then we're going to have a panel. And our panelists are going to each talk about one statement addressing the question, 
truly, how confident are we about what we know in this area? And critically, uh, what do we still need to know? So in the spirit of the next generation of research, each panelist will talk about one statement. And then together, we'll talk about uh, the ever-present question of what is the best way to translate, disseminate, uh, and share what we know about social, emotional, and academic development for practice, for policy, and for general audiences. So uh, before we begin, of course, I have some thank yous as well uh, to the Council of Distinguished Scientists for the work that they do um, and for their participation, active participation, very active um, participation <laughs> in the development of this brief. Couldn't we? We are a collective, so we do the work together. And uh, of course, other members of the commission, the staff of the commission, and all of their partners, those who support the commission, and my collaborator, Jennifer Kahn, and my lab, the Easel Lab at Harvard. So uh, to start, <laughs> um, and this we're going to start with What's actually included? This is the question that I probably get the most often from everybody. What fits in this domain and what are the boundaries? As is written in the preamble to the brief that's being released today, uh, the convergence of advances in research, support from the education and business communities, and policy momentum creates a rare window of opportunity. And as Clark McCown, a terrific colleague who works in this field, says in his brief, for the Future of Children issue on social and emotional learning that came out in the spring, the SEL project is at a critical moment. We have two decades at least, multiple decades, many decades of research on the topic, a great many effective approaches designed for preschools, for schools, for out of school time settings and other settings, and a number of major initiatives, including this national commission. These are happening all the way across the country. They are focused on social, emotional, and academic development. And as this array of headlines suggest, the world of practice and policy are responding. And this is, of course, just a tiny selection of the headlines. So I've been showing this a version of this slide for many years. And every time I show it, I update it with some more stuff. So you can imagine that there's lots of layers of headlines in this slide. So our intention at this moment, this brief, is to distill the evidence we have into a coherent set of statements and text that clearly summarizes what we know right now. So how did we get to this moment? Um, uh, the scientists who've been working with the National Commission include 28 researchers uh, on the CDS, and they are from a wide variety of disciplines. I've listed the actual disciplines up there to give you a sense. Our goal was to illuminate relevant evidence and recommend next steps in research. And so for the past year, this group has worked truly collaboratively to identify the critical findings and demonstrate how we learn. The research, which is robust, rigorous, extensive, irrefutable, shows that learning is social, emotional, cognitive, and academic. What we now have is a set of clear statements and a synthesis of the evidence that supports them that has been agreed to by this entire group from all these disciplines. So now truly to the three questions um, and our consensus. So I'm going to talk about the question, and then I'm going to highlight our consensus for each one. I'm going to start with this ever-present question of what is it? that we're actually talking about. And we all know this. There are a great many frameworks, organizational systems that describe and define social emotional skills and competencies, behaviors, attitudes, et cetera. And the common terms that we hear can include things like character education, personality, 21st century skills, soft skills, non-cognitive skills, just to name a few. There are a lot more. I have a much longer list that I carry around with me. Each label draws from a slightly different theoretical perspective, an important theoretical perspective, and draws upon a different body of research. And each has its own related fields and disciplines, which is why it is so important that this group of scientists has come together to share a coherent and consistent story about what it is we actually mean when we talk about social, emotional, 
and academic development. And so here's the consensus. The consensus is that, broadly speaking, we are talking about skills, competencies, habits, and beliefs, attitudes. You can fill in a fair amount of things in there in three interconnected domains. And they work like gears. They are intertwined. Cognitive skills that include things like executive functions, as well as beliefs and attitudes that guide, that guide one's sense of self and approaches to learning and growth. Emotional competencies that enable one to cope with frustration, recognize and manage emotions, understand others' emotions and perspectives. And social and interpersonal skills that enable one to read social cues, navigate social situations, resolve conflicts, cooperate, and work effectively in a team. Just listing those words, it's clear that all of those skills are central to the enterprise of learning in schools and out of schools. What else do we know about these areas, these domains of human development? Didn't work, sorry. Of human development, social, emotional, cognitive, academic, linguistic, uh, the list goes on for a little while. They're intertwined. They're intertwined in the brain and in behavior. And all of them are central to learning. These skills and competencies emerge, grow, and change over time from infancy, throughout childhood and adolescence, and then I wrote down in my notes, and even adults can change too, surprise. Um, and then finally, sorry, I'm not keeping up with the slides, skills and competencies develop in a complex system of contexts, interactions, and relationships. And these skills and competencies are deeply intertwined with settings and are embedded in relationships. Second question, what do we know? Uh, over the last several decades, we've built a body of evidence that includes everything you'd want to see. <laughs> so we have long-term correlational studies that span 20 to 30 years following the same sample. We have large multi-program studies and trials of specific interventions where things are randomized in preschool, school, and after-school contexts. We have both quantitative and qualitative forms of evidence that are drawn from families, children, and youth, schools, districts, and communities. And we have meta-analyses. We have summaries of studies, summaries of summaries. And we have critically cost-benefit analyses. What do they tell us? The consensus is that social and emotional skills and competencies have four words that we can describe them. They matter. So we know that they're linked to short and long-term outcomes for children and youth. They're linked to, to outcomes in settings. So uh, embedding a focus on social and emotional skills in schools changes characteristics of the setting. And they are, super importantly, a buffer or a direct approach to stress, trauma, and adversity. Second word, they are malleable. I just said this. They grow and change over time. There are intentional strategies and practices that make a difference, that drive change. Third, schools are central. They can be fostered in schools. Tim said this, schools and preschools are a key context for human development. It is where development is happening and a central ideal place for this work. Of course, in those settings and in all other settings, families and communities, adults are the linchpin. And then finally, the fourth, it's worth it. It's a benefit for all and a pathway to a more equitable society because the evidence indicates long-term social and economic benefits. And then our final question, what does it take? And the consensus is it takes integration. It takes weaving in a focus on these domains into the fabric, the practices, the very being of schools and schooling. It takes a foot. <laughs> you think I'd be better at the PowerPoint <laughs> in my life? Because I really do use it a lot. Um, it takes a focus on adults. Adults are the linchpin. Adults are a cornerstone. So that means teacher and other adult training. It supports wellness, competencies. And then finally, maintaining a careful attention to the quality and sustainability of practices on the ground and in systems. I don't want to just say we have to focus on implementation. 
because that tends to be a catch-all for a whole lot of other things. I think it's really uh, thinking what is implementation. It's about quality practices and sustaining them in the world. So I think I did that in 10 minutes. Um, so now our panel will come up, and they will each address one of the statements. And the first question, which is, how confident are we really about what we know in this area? And critically, what do we still need to know? And Camille is going to talk about matters. Mary Helen, malleable. Maurice, schools are central. And Oscar, it's worth it. If you remember those four things, we're good. <laughs> Come on up. And then after each person takes five minutes, sorry. Each person takes five minutes, and then we'll just have a group discussion about something has happened with the mic uh, about this question of how do we best translate, disseminate, and share this evidence with the world, practice, policy, and general audiences. So we will start with Camille. Okay, very good. So I'm uh, supposed to talk about what do we, what are we confident about that uh, social, emotional, and academic uh, development, and this integration of these matter, and then what don't we know. So I was thinking about that, like, I'm um, uniquely uh, qualified to talk about how these things are integrated, largely because one of the things that I um, early, one of the early things I wrote about this was around non-cognitive factors, which implies, <laughs> right, that these are separate from cognitive factors. And so this is a great opportunity to kind of put to death that, <laughs> that notion. So, and I will do that, you know, by way of education, by explaining. So, um, so non-cognitive, as, as Stephanie alluded, these terms come um, mean specific things. And so that idea was what can, comes out of economics, what can we explain um, by cognitive measures, specifically intelligence test, achievements test, versus um, what, what is not explained by cognitive measures. And everything that's not explained by cognitive measures fell under this notion of non-cognitive, just, which just meant intelligence tests, achievement tests don't explain outcomes, um, or they're not uh, directly correlated with those outcomes. So that's where that term comes from. That's the only usage of that term that actually makes sense. Um, because in point of fact, in development, in the brain, in human functioning, there's n nothing co non-cognitive about human beings unless they're dead. So really, it's <laughs> <laughs> so social, emotional, and academic development in the brain are like um, integrally connected. And even as you were talking about the three different areas, social, um, social cognitive, and emotional, to decide which thing goes in which bucket, it's hard to differentiate those out because any given uh, bit of human processing development um, involves all of those things simultaneously. Let me, uh, and, and in that, are we sure? Yeah, we're actually totally sure about that. <laughs> we know that, the science, the everything that we, um, all of the evidence, and kind of all of human history has told us that that's the case. That's been a belief in, of human beings for a long, long time, a belief in an understanding. So I think that's a settled question. Are social, emotional, and academic or cognitive domains interconnected? Yes, absolutely true. Um, the Separating out cognitive from academic, I think, is also important. Academic is like a subset of cognitive functioning. and um, we see that from early, early on, little babies are socially and emotionally wired. And um, their cognitive development comes through their social interactions. And that that continues to be the case as uh, little babies grow into young people and go off to school. And so the notion that you can kind of separate out academic learning from its basis in social emotional functioning is just wrong-headed. And unfortunately, that's the model that we've used um, to, to build schools. Um, but clearly, uh, 
these things are, are, are super interconnected. There's kind of no question as to whether that's true. There's also very clear evidence that um, competencies and development in any one of those domains support the development of competencies and development in the other domains. Um, if you're better at one, it helps you get better at the others. And um, that's also, we know that that's true through correlational work, through longitudinal work, through a lot of different kinds of evidence. So I think we know that. What we don't know is exactly the mechanisms of all of that, like um, what to do. Um, to, the intervention part is where we don't know a lot of stuff. Like what is the best kinds of interventions? Um, we know that what works for little kids um, is different than uh, little kids tend to learn through play, through social interaction. That's really the, the primary mode of, um, of intervention. Uh, there's evidence that school age kids learn from direct instruction in, in a lot of social um, competencies, social and emotional competencies. That doesn't work at all with adolescents. Adolescents don't like to be told um, <laughs> how they should act or what they should think. And then, and, uh, so um, in some ways, stealth interventions are the, are the kind of best <laughs> things with adolescents. You have to do it without them knowing what you're doing. Um, so it, we know that there's differences of what kids need depending on their development. But the details of that, you know, we're just scratching the surface. Um, and we also know that all of these things matter for short and long run outcomes that, uh, that whether you're talking about avoiding negative things, so risk behaviors, um, substance abuse, going to jail, getting pregnant early, all of those kinds of things um, are associated with social, emotional, and academic um, measures. And, um, in the short run, whether you're paying attention to class and do well on a test, you know, in a short run mm -hmm. sense, is very much uh, related to your interest, your focus, your attention, how you feel, what you believe about yourself, what you believe about your ability to do well on that particular task. So both in the short and the long run, um, all of these things are intertwined and affect each other super clear. Okay. Mary Helen. Uh, great. I, I think I'm done now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little about malleability, but what I thought I would do to add on to what Camille has told you is kind of give the sort of biological evolutionary psychodevelopmental situatedness for understanding malleability <laughs> and, for, uh, and for really reinforcing how incredibly plastic and environment dependent and subjectively perceptive our children are, human children are. And so what we're learning from the neuroscience and the psychological development and the educational studies is that it's really clear that we're shaped by our environments. This makes good sense because from an evolutionary perspective, all organisms need to adapt to the situations they find themselves in if they want to survive and flourish. Um, and human beings are intensively social creatures. This is sort of the legacy of our abstract intelligence. We have things like values and beliefs that are founded in social and cultural ways of experiencing the world that are in turn founded in relationships and in the learning that we do in cultural settings. And so it's a logical next step to understand that our malleability the very uh, uh, plasticity that allows us to survive and flourish and adapt to our environments is both a liability and a strength of education and must be leveraged in education for optimal development. That means that kids are situated in contexts and in settings that are literally shaping and growing the way in which they build skills for interpreting the world, for experiencing things, and I mean that in an active sense, the sense of constructing conscious awareness and meaning out of the things that you witness and out of the things that you feel, and that that meaning-making process is literally shaping the, the development of the brain. We're beginning now to see cultural, for example, differences in the ways 
that kids are growing and the ways that brain activity corresponds in real time to conscious experience. What this tells us is that we learn it. And the flip side of learning is malleability. It's the fact that we're subjectively uh, sort of constructing meaning and that that meaning constructing process in a social context using our cognitive skills is fundamental to organizing what we're capable of becoming into the future. And so social emotional skills are sort of at the center of human malleability because social and emotional skills are the center of our biological and evolutionary intelligence. Wait, someone write that one down. <laughs> I'm writing it down. It's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's taking me a little while to write this. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, uh, and Maurice. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank, are thanks for giving me that to follow. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm on page nine in the brief for those of you who are following along. And there are four bullet points that I'm going to get to address. And I, if I read them all, it would take five minutes. So I'm going to briefly summarize them, but at least you can see them. And I'm not going in the exact same order. Um, the first one I want to comment on is that SEED is an essential part of pre-K to 12 education that can transform schools. Uh, social and emotional competencies are not anything that we've uh, invented. Uh, it's like an archaeological find. They've always been there. They've been there since the dawn of time. And they are, in fact, the, the way kids learn about the world, uh, understand the world, and learn how to act in the world. And of course, their schooling is part of that. Uh, not the whole part, but it's part of that. So yes, schools, we know that schools are indeed um, the place where kids will learn the skills and learn to live the skills. And there's um, no doubt about the importance of that. The fact that schools can have a significant influence, uh, point number two, um, also the influence of the wider community. Uh, this is critically important because before the kids get to school, many kids have tremendous burdens. And those burdens will influence how kids experience school. So yes, indeed, there's no question that the wider community should be engaged to reduce the burdens on kids. This is the equity issue that I think we have to address with regard to social emotional learning. In a lot of the work we do, we talk about the fact that there are some kids that we work with that, in fact, have to do twice as much to go half as far. And so sometimes those kids are embedded in our data sets and can make our efforts look uh, less effective when, in fact, uh, we're accomplishing a tremendous amount given where we're starting. The third point is about the fact that for SEED to thrive, teachers and administrators need training and support. Uh, I think the evidence is now clear that uh, social and emotional competencies are something that you must possess to be an educator. And so if we start with that fundamental premise, uh, yes, indeed, we know that people are going to need training and support to do that, just as they need training and support to be an educator. Uh, I liken social and emotional competencies to reading. Uh, I believe they're absolutely as basic uh, I believe that if you can't read, you are going to have many difficulties in life. And in essence, if you can't read people and those around you, you are going to have uh, many, many difficulties in life. And finally, the uh, effective implementation is necessary to improve outcomes. Um, yes, I think we, we've learned that. We've learned that uh, from our data. Uh, the, the meta-analysis uh, in uh, child development in 2011 made it clear that the benefits of social and emotional learning are cumulative, and that, in fact, effective implementation is multi-year. It has to be developmentally sequenced. It has to be integrated into everything that happens, not just an isolated part of the school day. And it has to be modeled by the adults uh, around it. And again, if you could say the exact same thing about reading. Uh, as you can about social emotional competencies. What do we need to know? Uh, in each of the four statements, there's a phrase that I think captures what we still need to know. Uh, in one of them, there's a phrase about uh, success in the 21st century. Now, success is an ever-changing criteria. It's a shifting landscape. 
So the competencies that our kids are going to need to be successful are going to be changing. And so we can't say that what we know now about their competencies is going to be true for the future. What we do know is that whatever our children accomplish will be mediated by the relationships they have. So relationship competencies, I think we can be most confident about going forward. But there'll still be other competencies that our kids are going to need. Uh, the idea that uh, families in the wider community must be engaged, uh, I think we would understand that. But again, what does that mean? What is the level of engagement that really matters? Uh, how much engagement over what period of time? I think we have some intuitions about that. Uh, but I think that these are highly variable for different communities. And I think, again, this becomes a, a pivotal equity issue. The issue of training and support what training and support is needed. Uh, I think, again, we are going to be challenged to rethink the preparation of educators in the United States. Uh, I believe that we're not going to avoid making their preparation a bit more extensive. And I think that we are going to be thinking differently about support once they arrive uh, at the schoolhouse door. And that support is not episodic but it's ongoing. And that in order to accomplish this, we're going to have to invent some new systems for ongoing professional development among our educators. And finally, uh, the other phrase that we don't have a complete handle on is effective implementation. Uh, I would say with certainty that there are a number of us who are absolutely sure we know how to do this work. Uh, and equally true, that when we go into schools with the preconceived notion of what it's going to take, we're in trouble. So we know this is an evolving, contextually based process of effective implementation. And that is a competency that we actually need to understand better and instill. It's not a, a prescriptive set of things that people have to do in a prescriptive amount of time. It's a changing, contextually linked set of things that are required to result in effective implementation. OK, I wrote a lot of that down, too. Okay. <laughs> I feel like okay. can we, we're going to rewrite the brief. <laughs> we're not. We're not. It's all, yeah, it's it's all in there. It's all in there. <laughs> Oscar. OK, so I'm going to comment on whether all of these uh, issues and initiatives we've described are worthwhile doing, why, why we should do it. Um, and in the brief that's been prepared, there are several outcomes. One is that the outcomes of this work is positive, that all children will benefit, uh, that we can enhance quality of life uh, when, we in, um, when we implement them, that it improves teacher well-being, that it's cost effective, and it contributes to achieving equity in our society. Uh, so those are very compelling motivations. Uh, however, I think some are stronger, some weaker than others. Uh, I think that uh, examining the data on economic benefits and the use of that as, a, as an argument for doing this, I think is somewhat weak. Uh, there clearly are, I believe the data, there are um, contributions in the long run to economic competitiveness perhaps to GDP growth, uh, savings on remedial services, social services, criminal justice that will have to be offered if some of the issues that we see early on in life are not um, uh, ad addressed. However, I think it's a weak argument uh, because there's a distinction between immediate payoff and long-term payoff, that the people who actually have to pay don't, pen don't benefit from it. And so the motivation for them is going to be weaker uh, because the savings and the economic benefits don't come to much later, yet we're asking schools uh, to ante up, uh, in a sense. And we assume that there is a sense of themselves as a larger system in which there is a sort of equal sharing of resources, which, which is not the case. I think the other thing that's important is to, if we think about um, the issue of equity, that there clearly are multiple challenges uh, that vulnerable populations face, and that the programs that are geared 
uh, to serve them aren't always adapted. And so I think there's a great deal of research that needs to be done on how do we adapt these programs uh, so that they are uh, suitable and they fit the needs of the uh, children that they're intended to serve. Uh, the third thing is I think that we need to have a shift in terms of our goal. Uh, the shift from thinking about what are the economic benefits of this uh, to understanding uh, the ultimate goal. And what I would say is we need to appeal to our higher angels that the, the goal really is to lead all of us on a pathway to a better life, to a good life. Now that seems very vague, but it actually really is one of the most important, I think, outcomes that are possible here. Uh, what I would argue is that once we think about this, once we make the shift, we realize then uh, that the kinds of things that we need to do will be a bit different. That we need to focus, for example, on the outcome of peace. Peace within, peace between people, and peace among, peace among us. That socio-emotional learning, academic learning, can contribute to inner peace, to our understanding ourselves, and to learning to manage sort of our own demons. Uh, can be useful in helping us to manage relationships that, so that we reduce conflict among us. And it could help us to draw, to draw uh, develop a broader sense of the common good so that when we think about differential interests, competing interests, we're able to balance that against the common good. The, the one thing then that I would say is that if we're going to be successful in implementing these programs, we have to look at uh, trying to shift to long-term outcomes, focus on long as opposed to short-term. However, it's the short-term outcomes that will motivate people to do it. And so we have to think about then, so what are the current impediments to implementing these kinds of programs? And the, the first one I would say is they're competing priorities. We're telling teachers, first of all, you have to be concerned about your own competence. Uh, so we built in questions of um, accountability, testing teachers, so that the short-term outcome really directly affects them. I think we need to shift and modify that. Uh, the second thing is limited bandwidth, that teachers and administrators only have so much bandwidth with which to manage these things. So it's almost as though we have to develop programs that become intuitive. Because if teachers have to think consciously about all the, about the reading and socio-emotional issues, they're going to say, I know where the priorities are. The priorities are getting those scores up uh, so that I'll have a positive evaluation at the end. Um, limited training. Uh, I think teachers will often argue, and I wasn't trained to be a psychologist or a social worker. So why are you asking me to do all of these things, which I can't do? And so what I would argue is that we really need to think about, instead of having that one person on the line, on uh, the teacher being so totally responsible for delivering these, that we really have to think about a team of people. So the notion of embedded consultation, where you have mental health professionals, social service professionals engaged and involved in the classroom, seen as a legitimate part of the instructional team, I think is an important shift. Uh, and finally, I think we have to move beyond self, limited self-interest, short term, uh, to think about what it means uh, to be on a path towards a better life. And so for those of you who took, how many of you took second year Latin, took Cicero? A few of you. OK, so this, is, this would be something else. So Cicero, uh, who was a great orator and statesman, talked about the good life that he, he talks about as combining contentment as well as moral virtue, and that the two are in, inextricably tied together. And he probably described in a very simple way, hundreds of years ago, what we were after in terms of uh, socio-emotional learning. And he would say, to check our passions, to hold our lusts under control, and protect and care for what belongs to us while keeping our thoughts, eyes, and hands off what belongs to our neighbor. So I'll stop there. <laughs>
there's the definition right there. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so uh, our, our, so I've, I'm going to do two things. The first is um, I'm going to uh, <laughs> I'm going to repeat a few things that I heard because I think some of them are so uh, great, and I'm sure there are tweeters abounding. Um, and this would be things that you could tweet. Um, because I think they're, they're interesting things to highlight, and they're related to each other across the panelists. And I'm going to do that while you four are thinking about something that's key. And I'm sure this happens to you frequently, and I'm sure it happens to you all frequently, which is that um, we haven't been successful in communicating well what is here and the kinds of things that you just described uh, to the world, to the world in general, so to lay audiences, but also to the world of practice and the world of policy. And what are your suggestions for how we can more effectively communicate the essence so that it's held, so that the questions aren't about, is this a fad, or is it really just about X or Y? That, that do come up over and over again. So I'm going to let you think while I highlight a couple of things that I think they're, everything uh, we heard was so useful and so interesting. A couple to highlight. Um, one is something that I say, but I think is actually what Camille said, which is that uh, the words don't do justice to the truth. So the words that we have to describe the skills and competencies and how they are intertwined uh, don't yet live up to the reality, which is exactly what Camille said, which is that they're deeply, deeply tied together. And um, I think that we have to be, as a group, super careful about calling that out as a challenge as we do the work so that we don't uh, mistakenly mislead the world that we're talking about things as these dichotomous separate entities. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I think is really important to carry forward. The other is that it's all developmental, right? So it's all growing and changing over time, and that when we think about what to do, it also has to be developmental. So we need to think about the practices, the strategies, the interventions from a developmental standpoint. Uh, we also heard this idea that this malleability. We heard neuropsychobio, and then I couldn't, I didn't write down the rest of those. But, um, but that's important. But, that's, but that malleability, which is at its core plasticity, is both a liability and an opportunity. That's a pretty profound statement. It means that we have, we can leverage and capitalize and work intentionally on these areas, or we can lose out because we're not. But it's happening still, right? The plasticity is, the plasticity is there in settings. Um, a fourth is uh, about implementation, that uh, when we talk about implementation, again, the words we use tend to be fixed. It has to be this way or that way. We have to get to high quality, fidelity, dosage, and so on. What Maurice is telling us is that effective implementation is evolving. It's dependent itself on the context, the approach. And that's really important to carry forward because it means we, continue, we have to always be addressing it. It's not just a fixed entity to get to. And then finally, uh, I wanted to call out the value of shifting the conversation, although it is important, away from our uh, maniacal economic view, <laughs> it is important, to a different kind of goal, which is, uh, as Oscar said, to lead all of us to a better life or pathway. And that really leads us right into the communications part. So how do we begin to shift how we talk about the work so that the world is shifting how the world thinks about the work? Should Oscar. I not say what you said? Um, you were going to yes. go first? No, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to say what I have to say before other people say it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was my strategy. So, I guess the, the first thing I would start off with is communication. 
Uh, there's a principle, I think that's been embedded in this whole project, that has to do with listening to different constituents. And I would just want to underscore that a, a lot more. Uh, someone said we have one mouth and two ears because we're intended to listen twice as much as we talk. And I think that we have to begin with the notion that when we talk, we're speaking from our own framework, as though we were the first persons or the only persons to encounter this as a problem. When, in fact, teachers, principals, parents are struggling with the same issues. And so I think we have to start with how do they frame the issues, what are the pro how do they construe the problem, and then convey what we understand in terms that meet their, so it's solving their problem. So we define it as our problem to communicate all these great things we know, instead of how do we help them solve the problem that they're facing every day. And then um, I think the second issue has to do with the kind of flexibility we show, that we don't have all the answers, uh, although we know a lot. There's a lot that we don't know, and being able to admit that. And then the third thing is conveying a sense of optimism, because parents and teachers, some people may feel hopeless about changing the situation. And yet we know so much that is a source of optimism, the, fa the fact that these problems aren't fixed, that traits aren't, don't determine uh, necessarily all the outcomes for kids, and that there are ways to manage these issues. And so to the extent that we can uh, thematically put through all of the things we say, hey, we have good news. Uh, we have things that may be helpful to you uh, and we, things that we think are worth testing and trying out. Damn, that's exactly what I said. I know, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm through. <laughs> so I will say, in, in my experience, the, the issue is less that people don't get it uh, and more that they're not sure how to do it. And I think we do people a disservice when we don't tell them that what we're talking about is fundamentally transformational. Mm -hmm. That their school, if, if this is something new to their school, their school's not going to be the same when they're through with us and when we're through with them. Uh, and it's different. You know what happens when you've gone into schools that are already doing this and you sort of help them along. It's like you put a booster on the rocket and shoo, it goes. But when you're starting off, it takes that period of time because people have a natural hesitation about change. Uh, innovation, what we perceive as innovation, anybody else still perceives as threatening. But what's sure to us is not sure to most. So to me, I think we have to lay out the, the, the pathways of implementation and provide the support structures, including the, the safety net you know, under the trapeze artists, uh, so that there's confidence that there's going to be an ongoing process, and as you say, of inevitability of success. Mm -hmm. uh, I've worked in some districts for two, three, five, seven, eight years to get them to the point of sustainability. Uh, you know, I, I got better things to do. I got two grandchildren, but this is what is needed. Uh, so I, I think that this needs to also be embedded in structures. There are not enough of us around to do this. So we have to think about, again, transforming educational preparation, educational leadership preparation. Uh, it's, it's a big ask, but I actually think it's an ask that many people out in the field are waiting to have happen, because they are very unhappy with the current status quo and the first order change that they're constantly being asked to implement. I suppose, I suppose what I would add builds directly on what the both of you have just said, um, which is that I think we need to use our own social emotional skills a little bit in our communication efforts and realize that the people we're talking to, though they really want to need this, are frightened. Right? We're, we're a little bit scared to let go of the stuff that we had before because of the intense pressures to succeed in a really competitive economy and a really uh, sort of uh, cutthroat kind of um, um, way that, that our current society and success are defined. And so it really needs to be a systemic effort in which we 
sort of help people to step back from that kind of treadmill path and start to see that the personhood that you develop is actually going to facilitate much broader kinds of happiness, much broader kinds of success and productivity and purposefulness that will be worth it, and that it's OK to feel unsettled during this period of change. And I like that. And building off of that, I, I, if fundamentally human beings are meaning makers, that's what drives us. That's everything that we do. And that if the, if the meaning for school people is, uh, you know, get better test scores, you know, that's not what any teacher went into teaching profession to do. So I think that, I think that the framing that is more aspirational, that is much more about recognizing human beings are, we're a social species, and that uh, we have to be paying attention to social outcomes, um, and that those, uh, we, we care about each person's life and, and our you know, collective human uh, uh, future, that that's much more inspirational and much more liable to, um, to motivate people to really want to make change than is a much more economic, you know, accountability kind of driven thing. And that, so that's a, a, one thing that's kind of exciting about this is that all of the work that we know about individual human beings also applies here in how we, would we approach um, kind of massive change and thinking about education. One thing about social, emotional, and academic development and the idea of, of integration it's not as if we need to integrate these things. Um, they're already integrated. <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. So then what we need to do is say, well, given that they are already integrated in, in human development mm -hmm. and in brain functioning and in learning, how do we design schools that, ca that, mo yeah, that capitalizes on that mm -hmm. particular fact? And the uh, truth is that we haven't designed schools with that in mind. We've designed schools in a very regimented way, even just you know, one subject, and then 45 minutes later, you go to the next subject, and 45 minutes to the next subject. It's, it's so antithetical to how we learn and think, mm -hmm. so that it really requires fundamental rethinking of school design. And I think, as you're saying, Oscar, bringing in other experts into, into that mix to really be able to guide that. Um, and, and lastly, just that, um, that relationships and opportunity and experience is the fundamental purpose, should be the fundamental purpose of schooling and the fundamental mechanisms whereby development and growth happen so that those have to be foregrounded in, in thinking about what we're doing. So, um, I think a, an aspirational vision about po the potential of every young person, that everybody living a life where they have um, agency and a sense of identity and a set of competencies that are socially valued, that that should be the goal for every young person. And, um, and how do we design a public education system that gets us there collectively is, is the task in front of us. Okay, no problem. Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> totally agree with all of you. So we have we have about twelve minutes for questions, um, maybe twelve to fifteen minutes for questions, and there there are mics roaming around the room. Roger. <laughs> Roger Weisberg from Castle. I wanted to begin by correcting one historical record. Uh, Tim said I <laughs> quoted Candace Pert about academics being more willing to share uh, toothbrushes than terminology. I did, I did say that in a meeting, but I also said that if we were given time to come together and think through the issues, we would be able to work it out, and I had great optimism in that. So thank you <laughs> to your leadership and, um, and in helping us to pull that together. Uh, the, the quick comment that I wanted to make, um, there's a lot in here about what we agree on, I think, but it's mostly at the level of school. And uh, one of the things, and maybe it's the future and things that we're working on now, how do you go from the state house to the schoolhouse to the classroom is, I think, a key issue. What does it mean to have ESSA? What does it mean to have state plans? 
what is state policy that can be supportive of this work, and especially what can be done uh, at the district level to support quality uh, programming and implementation in schools. So I think that um, we have a horizon ahead of us as we think about the systemic work that needs to be done and how multiple levels uh, from federal to state to district to school to classroom to individual uh, interactions, uh, there, there's a, a big agenda there, I think, ahead. So, I mean, I would just uh, say, so we're, what is the, so we need to build the evidence base to draw from, in part, to do that work. I mean, there, there is, there's work out there, but that's one area of opportunity and growth that is absolutely necessary for a next generation of research in this field. Does anyone have any comment? Yeah, just the thought about ESA, that in, in fact, the Every Student That Succeeds Act has in fact relinquished much of federal control, so that much of the action is at the state level. And so I, my own sense is that we're gonna have uh, 51 different approaches to educational policy, but that the, the notion of changing what we assess seems to me an important policy level issue because until socio-emotional issues are embedded in uh, the outcomes that we're looking for, that it's gonna be harder for principals and teachers uh, to try to refocus. I can, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I was a teacher. Okay, hi. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm Kristen Jameson. This is so exciting. We're, we're uh, part of a team here that's from Charlottesville. Um, and I teach at the University of Virginia in the Batten School for Public Policy. And um, I also am in this county trying to establish a seed team, social, emotional, academic development within the county. And um, my research focuses on trauma, at, or did, <laughs> focus on trauma and, and what that looks like in the classroom and how we can create an environment that is safe for children. Sorry, my back is too. Um, what I am really interested in hearing about is safety in the classroom. And we know that that affects the brain. We know that the prefrontal cortex is taken offline when a child isn't feeling safe. How would you insert the feeling of safety and community in the classroom into this very well-written mm -hmm. assessment? So I would just say one, uh, one little thing, which is, and maybe this is uh, an opportunity, another opportunity moment, um, which is that there is, so there is evidence that, um, that in places where programs or approaches or strategies that focus on social and emotional skills uh, are embedded, one of the outcomes at the setting level is kids' perceptions of safety. Um, that, that body of evidence, I feel like, is strong, and we can hang our hat on it. It's not quite the safety that you're talking about, which is, um, which, is which I don't think we've, we've developed the kinds of tools that we can use to capture the type of safety that I think you're referring to, which is a kind of psychological and behavioral safety for everybody, but also in particular for children who are exposed to episodic, chronic stress and trauma. So um, what do you guys think? Well, yeah. This is the, the issue that I, I was raising earlier uh, in the sense that um, more is necessary for kids that are undergoing trauma because the, the usual things that will establish a sense of safety in the classroom won't be reaching deep enough for them. So it's going to take time and extra effort. I work in urban centers where I'm assuming that every child is, in fact, uh, trauma afflicted. And we find that we have to spend much, much more time on trust building. So we're, we're going back to our old Eric Erickson. And we're assuming these kids have some very deeply ingrained mistrust that's not going to give way to a few lessons and activities. Um, and, and we'll be subject to a lot of backsliding as the adults in their environment uh, are exceptions. So it becomes 
but we know that safety is primary. And so what, what will the kids be able to learn if they don't feel safe? Uh, and eventually, we find that educators who realize that kids are not actually learning in spite of being subject to a lot of instruction, uh, when they take the time, and this is something that we know from data from programs like Responsive Classroom, to significantly build relationships and trust, uh, that will have payoffs down the road in kids' openness to learning and openness to one another. But that has an explicit commitment of time and priority. As you were saying, the incentive structures don't necessarily reinforce that at present. So those are, those are the obstacles. It's not that, again, not that we don't know. Uh, it's creating the avenue to do what we know is right. Oscar, I would say that one of the ways that we could probably amplify it is to really focus in on the notion of secure attachments. That when children have adults in their lives who they can count on, whom they can go to support, for support, I think it generates a sense of security. And so sort of emphasizing the school is a place that can complement the home so that when the home is, does not provide uh, that sense of security, that sense of, a, of an adult who is there watching your back, that we have teachers who, and other staff uh, who attempt to, uh, to step into that role. I don't think it's possible for teachers to become, quote, attached figures, but they can provide the child the sense that I have your back, I'm tuned into what you're experiencing, why you're experiencing it, and I'm here for you. I'm here to, to be the secure base for you. Um, and it seems to me that is a fundamental thing uh, that we have a lot of research on that could make a big difference. I'm going to go to this side. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> OK. Uh, David Adams uh, out of the Urban Assembly in New York City. Um, so I just wanted to, to quickly speak to your point, Oscar, around the question for teachers when they say, I'm not a social worker or I'm not a counselor, mm -hmm. uh, and Professor Elias being kind of a uh, background in clinical counseling. I was just wondering um, your thoughts on the proliferation of mental health specialists in schools, how that impacts teachers' transfer of responsibility from themselves to mm -hmm. the mental health professionals, mm -hmm. um, and then teachers' reticence to be able to address or respond to low-level basic relationship development pieces right. that don't necessarily need a licensed clinical social worker to develop. So right. how does that balance okay. uh, implement, and, and what are your Okay, I would start with saying I much prefer to have mental health professionals in the classroom than policemen. Uh, <laughs> and so that, I would start there. The second is that it is tricky uh, not to go in as a mental health professional saying, okay, here I am to save you, you know, the cavalry's here, uh, and that you're modeling and working. So it's almost like a coach. And for the mental health professional to recognize that there are different levels of intervention, right? One is helping the teacher to deliver uh, level one universal interventions, second step or any other. Uh, um, versus helping the teacher to deal with their feelings about particular kids and ma trying to manage that because sometimes they're part of the problem. And then the third is recognizing that there's some kids who have very, very serious issues and that you can be loving and responsive, but it's not going to change the problem and it's not your, your, your responsibility and your responsibility primarily is to help them adapt and manage themselves in the classroom as best they can. So the idea is for the mental health consultant to start with, I'm not here to show the teacher how good I am at dealing with kids, but I'm here to help you. This is your problem, your issue in your classroom. I'm here to help you in any of a number of different ways. And I think it, that stance can make a big difference. So one thing I just want to add, I think based on the last two questions, is, is something to be aware of, which is unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. so, so I think what you're raising is the potential for an unintended consequence of doing something that we really think is important to do, which is embedding mental health professionals in schools who can sometimes, if the system isn't organized around it, be uh, the catch-all for this work as opposed to weaving it into what's happening in all the settings in the school. I think that's true with 
uh, questions about safety, which is that there is a sort of a systems level question about that, which is how do we, how do we address disciplinary norms and practices in schools that can sometimes work against our best efforts to build trust and safety mm -hmm. with kids who in particular face stress and trauma, but really all kids. So this sort of systems level challenge, I think is really a high lever for the work going forward. I think we have time for one more question, but it's like, Shelly. Shelly Berman from Andover. Um, I've been doing this work as a superintendent for 25 years, and I just want to ask her in a comment you made, I wanted to just share an insight that, that I've had. That we have classroom management practices that teachers learn in ed schools and, um, and in other vehicles. It's one of the basics of managing your classroom and, and being effective. I think what we're really talking about is a different style of management. And so it isn't about necessarily bringing mental health professionals in. It's about creating a sense of community in the classroom mm -hmm. and, and managing it in a different way that may not be the classic disciplinary focus of a classroom. Mm -hmm. But it raises a question, and it's a question for all of you on the panel and who've pulled together this research. Um, early on uh, in this work, I think the Developmental Studies Center did a, a very comprehensive piece of research looking at uh, what was effective in terms of social-emotional learning and, and programs that uh, develop social-emotional learning. And the research found that it was the nature of community, whether it was in program or non-program classes, that teachers who were effective in creating a sense of community yeah. in yeah. the classroom actually had the same kinds of impacts. Yeah. But I don't think we're, we necessarily talk a lot about what does it mean to build community and what is, what is the impact of community in the classroom. And my work has really focused on that sense of mm -hmm. that classroom management is about building community. It's not about discipline. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wanted to ask all of you as doing this research, where does community fit and the building of community in classrooms fit into the context of our thinking about social emotional learning? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd love to respond to that. <laughs> so the, the idea of learning environments being one of the kind of critical mechanisms for all of this, I, I think we can't underscore the importance of that, and, and your question speaks to that directly. So if we know that uh, human beings to engage in learning need to be, feel psychologically safe, they need to feel psychologically connected to the other people in the room, they need to feel like they are engaged in a, an endeavor that matters um, to themselves and to the other people that they're engaged in that endeavor with. Um, they need to believe that they can be successful at it. They need to be able to see the clear path to do that. And all of that can be communicated through a learning environment and through teacher practice and through um, uh, some like explicit messaging of the teacher, but a lot of it uh, around mindset work, I always say like the, the idea of um, mindsets we talk about as beliefs that, that students have in a classroom, that it's easier to believe if it's true. Yeah. And so if, you, if you, you're trying to convince people you know, of a sense of belonging, then you have to have a community that they want to belong to. Mm -hmm. um, if you want people to believe they can succeed, you have to make their success um, foremost in what you're trying to do in that and communicate that in ways that are really tangible to them. So I, I think that, um, well, I said before that it's already integrated in our brains, but it's not integrated in our practice. And so thinking about how do we create communities and learning environments that integrate the social and emotional needs as well as the cognitive needs of kids and um, creating curriculum and practice that, uh, that um, integrates those things just kind of right off the bat without the teacher having to be a mental health professional, I think is, is how we get there. Okay, I'm gonna give Oscar the last word. Okay, because we got a great. About so to first of all, I wanna say your comments are spot on. I think if we build more of a sense of community in classrooms, we would need mental health professionals in the classroom for most kids. Um, how do they do? I spent lots of time, fun time, observing in early childhood classrooms. And I've seen teachers do a couple of things that are amazing. One is one teacher getting kids to help one another. So the teacher had the principal 
try three before me. I love that idea. That is, if you have a problem, you go to two or three other kids before you come to me. And the second one is resisting the temptation to say that your achievement is yours alone. And so if you're successful, then go and help someone else. Uh, and then they'll be able to help you in something else. And then the third is when there's behavioral transgressions, it's not just the child breaking the teacher's rule. It's the classroom having developed a set of rules and that it is uh, an anomaly. It's something that violates our understanding of how we want to be with one another. And therefore, the punishment, if there is a punishment, is not simply for the teacher to you to do something, go to time out, but it's for you to come back into the community as a full member by being apologetic. You know. And so we have restorative justice practices, which are, I think, a good way. So there are lots of ways, but community really, I think, having a good community is an important foundation. So just to say two last words, can't help myself. Um, one is that building on this conversation for a next generation research agenda, I would say that what you've highlighted is a mechanism. So, and this is an area of research in this field that we haven't uh, done enough in, which is to say, what are the mechanisms that account for why any particular program or strategy or approach mm -hmm. is effective? And then we build the mechanism as opposed to just yeah. embed mm -hmm. programs. Yeah. So, and I think that that's a very important area for, to take all of this work to the next level, and you just identified one. Um, so, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> note of next generation research. We are going to move to the next panel and hear several perspectives about how research can inform the integration of social, emotional, and academic development. We're going to take a okay, minute okay. to yep. set up. Thank you. Okay. Yep, about five minutes. No, no, we're actually going to make a slight change. We're going to make a change. So, um, two quick changes. First, because uh, I made a mistake. Yes. I, I forgot at the beginning okay. Sure. It's okay. to introduce the superintendent of the Washington, D.C. public schools, Antoine Wilson, who's in our midst. Uh, I want to thank you. Uh, I think Mary Helen would rename you the chief evolutionary neurobiological social psychological development officer. <laughs> Uh, but we should think about maybe chief child development officers. Maybe that's really uh, a way to think about who you are and the unique position you were. So we want to thank Antoine for taking the time to join us. And secondly, since this meeting was designed by and for scholars, there has been no scheduled time for social or emotional interaction. <laughs> So we're going to do some non-cognitive, even though the term is dead. We're going to use it one last time. We're going to have a five-minute non-cognitive break. Five minutes. Refresh your coffee and come back, and we'll have the next panel. <laughs>
I have the short version of the Bridgeland bio and the long version of the Bridgeland bio. <laughs> if I could ask everyone uh, to grab a seat. Dr. Elias. Um, the next panel will be chaired by the uh, extraordinarily flexible, uh, powerful, uh, collaborative, insightful, and wise John Bridgeland, a veteran not only of the highest levels of public policy in this country, but also of the grassroots mechanics and messaging that change uh, requires. Uh, we are so lucky to have Bridge as a commissioner and as the moderator of this panel, the great John Bridgeland. Thank you, Tim. Tim, Tim always makes you feel a lot better about yourself. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm actually a sub. We've all had substitute teachers. I'm actually a substitute moderator today. And uh, Linda Darling Hammond, the wonderful co-chair of this commission, uh, is uh, proudly now a grandmother. And I'm actually very confident that that grandchild will have the social, emotional, and academic <laughs> development. <laughs> And I guess our charge is to bring that same spirit uh, to all children in America. I can't, um, having listened to this stunning last panel um, and having read every word of Stephanie Jones's uh, report uh, of bringing together 28 distinguished scientists um, together around such a powerful uh, consensus that will inform what happens in schools and communities. Uh, I can't help but think about uh, the power of the Aspen Institute and its convening power and what a wise choice it was, Tim and Linda and John Engler and Ross and Walter, uh, to use this convening power to bring those scientists, parents, students, um, nonprofit leaders, those working in schools together for this extraordinary commission. My own personal story, interestingly, I was reflecting on, I was, as I was listening to Oscar talk about Cicero, I was a 16-year-old kid and was auditing a seminar at the Aspen Institute with my father um, by Mortimer Adler, who had just released Encyclopedia Britannica and uh, Great Ideas from the Great Books. And he talked in a private conversation I had with him about the purpose of education and leading young people toward the complete and happy life that wasn't about immediate pleasure and pain, it wasn't even about economic prosperity, but about at the end of your life being able to reflect upon uh, your entire life and whether it was in accord with uh, civic virtue, he said, and those uh, skills and competencies and aptitudes that you are supposed to be acquiring in your community and society. And, and looking at the state of our country, you know, men and women are good enough to make democracy possible, but also bad enough to make it necessary. I also think of the centrality <laughs> of uh, social and emotional and academic development uh, to the state of our, our civic life uh, and the leaders uh, at all levels. So we're uh, really excited today to have four extraordinary leaders with us who are going to give us a kind of a cross-sector perspective on what we just heard and the relationship between this next generation of research and how it's marshaled in schools and communities. Um, 
Our first uh, panelist uh, that, that uh, Tim renamed as the Chief Psycho Neuro <laughs> Social <laughs> Development Officer is Anton Wilson. You know him as the Chancellor of the DC Public Schools, but he was also a former teacher, principal, or superintendent in Raleigh, uh, Wichita, Denver, Oakland, and now we're lucky to have him in Washington. He also gets up every day at 3 a.m to exercise and meditate and prepare for his day. So good afternoon, Antoine. That's right, that's right. <laughs> it's nice to have you with us. Uh, Mark Brackett, um, such an exceptional human being, researcher, scientist, I think social entrepreneur, is the director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, a professor at the Yale Child Study Center, developer of an evidence-based program uh, approach, approach to SEL called Ruler that I think is now in over 1,000 schools around the world published over 100 articles, and is a fifth degree black belt. <laughs> so don't mess with Mark. <laughs> Zoe Stem Calderon is the director of the education at the Rakes Foundation, uh, which has been such a powerhouse on so many fronts, including uh, supporting the work of this commission. Formerly at the Gates Foundation, um, obtained her doctorate at the Harvard School of Education, wrote an incredible dissertation that's relevant to today's topic. Was an elementary school teacher, assistant principal in Houston, and a senior leader for Teach for America for many years, and the great Jim Balfance, the president of one of America's finest national service organizations, uh, City Year, and also the co-developer with the, call them the, the Balfance brothers, the <laughs> Diplomas Now initiative, which is an evidence-based program helping uh, students in high-need schools uh, with, with terrific uh, research behind it. Uh, I traveled with Jim in London, and I've never had such an experience where you, uh, we met with the Prime Minister and Prince Charles all in one day, and that was because of the power of City Year and, and Jim Balfance. So please welcome our, our panel. So as a, as a substitute teacher, I'm going to be a little easier. You know how you had a substitute teacher, and they're, they're often a little, little uh, easier. Um, I'm just going to open with a general question, asking for um, uh, your insights on uh, how do you view research and evidence currently in your own work, and what steps do you take to actually institutionalize it in a way where it's a priority in the work you do in schools and nonprofit organizations, in your philanthropy, and in your center? So, Antoine. Well, uh, thank you for the uh, question. I appreciate the. Um the uh, forum and the, the opportunity to, to be a part of it and that I uh, appreciate my scheduler for being able to uh, make the time, clear some things. I also want to appreciate our chief of uh, um, our Office of Teaching and Learning, Brian Pick, who's uh, joined us here today. I'm uh, fortunate enough to be around some really talented people. Um, I think the, the, the research, whether you're talking about um, social emotional academic development, whether you're talking about um, strategies to help students uh, thrive in the classroom or feel welcome in the classroom, uh, strategies to help uh, connect families to uh, schools and, and, and have them feel a sense of empowerment, regardless of the, uh, of the area, I think it's extremely important to the work. I mean, I think uh, for our teachers, our, our, our principals, our people training the, our educators, um, trying to understand what the research uh, says, uh, what the theories are in terms of uh, what leads to effectiveness, is extremely relevant to the work. It also helps people understand what's possible. Um, and so I think that's extremely important. Uh, one of the topics that came up in the uh, last conversation uh, was also speaking to just evidence and uh, be looking, beyond, um, looking beyond what we might typically uh, feel comfortable uh, thinking about when we think about school. And I would just say for us in DCPS, um, Looking at practical applications is extremely important as well, and trying to understand what's working at, at, at even in micro levels in individual classrooms with students. Um, we are really interested in that, and uh, ideas that are bubbling up from um, teachers or principals or coaches, um, social workers, if you will, in various contexts, we're really interested in that. And then trying to ask ourselves, does this have implications for our larger practice? Now, uh, many of you may know in, in, in DC we just rolled out a, a new strategic uh, plan, uh, a capital commitment, it's um, 2017 through 22, and in that we lay out our vision for DCPS, and, and I think it's very much informed for us by what the research is, is saying, and that vision is that our students feel loved, challenged, uh, prepared to positively influence society and thrive in life, and for me, um, having a vision that speaks to <coughs> aspiration 
and speaks to positivity and leans into positive reinforcement about what's possible and how we can collectively create um, an experience that prepares students to be them, their best selves and interact with the, the world around them. I mean, I think that that is an example of of how uh, we can take what we know um, motivates people and influences people and puts it into, into practice. And so I'll pause there and, and uh, look forward to, um, to sharing more. We're glad you're there. Thank you. Well, thank Mark? You. Sure. Um, you know, this morning's panel made me realize again that because our work is not one of the three R's, right, that our work is so much harder, right? No one's thinking the same way we are about the math curriculum necessarily or whatever other curriculum. Um, and what that means is that we have so much more to prove, right, uh, in this space. Um, because when you think about schools, um, we would never expect a principal to have to be uh, an expert at every content, in every content area, right? They don't need to know, a high school principal doesn't need to know the physics curriculum necessarily. Just has to trust that he's got great or she's got great science teachers. Um, but we expect the principal of that school to create an environment where teachers want to work and where students want to learn and where families feel good about dropping off their kids. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there that I think that because we're in this place of not being part of necessarily or mandated or, you know, align, you know, to the superintendent in every district, we have this additional worry in terms of the research that we have to do. So is it about the superintendent's skills and abilities? Is it about the principal's skills and abilities? Is it about the teachers? Is it about the students? Is it about the community? Is it about the school context? So we have to do research in all those areas to really make our case. Um, with that said, I just want to point out that um, another thing that came up for me this morning in terms of the work we're doing is I think what we need to think about in our education settings is the difference between thoughts and feelings and behavior and social and emotional and academic skills, because I see them as quite different, um, such that I really care about how kids feel in classrooms. Um, I was a kid who did not feel connected or supported or valued or appreciated, or I was mostly alienated and anxious. Um, nor did I have skills. So I was like, whoa, like, thank you for that opportunity. <laughs> uh, thank you for the opportunity to dedicate my life uh, to the field. Um, and I say that seriously because they are, they are different. I work at a university where feelings don't necessarily matter. Um, and I also work at a place where people have been very successful without social and emotional skills. Um, so I just want to put that out there, and I just got fired. <laughs> so hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad that I got that signed letter from the president of the university a couple of years ago. But um, I just want to, I just think that's so important for us to think about, because um, if we don't um, recognize that this work is about creating those key emotions for students to feel connected and supported um, in their learning environments, um, and also think about the trajectory of the skills that kids need to support themselves. And, you know, Camille, you mentioned this morning, right, the way we teach these skills to preschoolers and kindergartners is different than elementary students and high school students. So we do need these frameworks um, to support the direct instruction of this work in schools. Um, and I feel like what we have to work toward is um, making this a permanent piece so that the direct instruction actually um, is there. So um, I want to answer Bridget's question, because I don't want to make him look like a bad substitute. But I also just want to build on what Mark said, which is like, um, I think it's just right in reading this really great um, priority, set of priority research areas, um, I think the sentence that I was most struck with was, learning is social emotional. And putting that next to social, you know, social emotional learning, which the field is mostly talking about, right? Mm -hmm. And that um, to Stephanie's points this morning, I think we have a responsibility. The words matter. The way we frame things matters. And when we say social emotional learning, we tend to then think about the skills we need to build in young people, mm -hmm. right? And that's important. And that's, but 
We also need to think about learning is social emotional, which means we need to take care of young people's social and emotional experience as we ask them to do deep and rich learning. And, and we need to hold both as a community of folks who are you know, trying to advance a stronger theory of learning for the field. Um, and, and that's, I think, what we do at Rakes, or what we hope to do, is um, you know, the way that research connects to the work that we, we fund, I feel really blessed that every day I get to work along really fabulous researchers and really amazing practitioners who kind of, we're able to fund to break down silos and sort of go sit shoulder to shoulder together to solve really important problems, right? To bring insights about the role of social and emotional competencies in learning to big problems of practice, things like um, you know, how could we build a deeper sense of belonging in AP and IB courses so that many, many, many more underrepresented kids are succeeding in those courses, right? Like, that's a question that practitioners have deep insight into. That they really care about solving, and this research and researchers can bring new lenses, new measures, new ways of thinking about those problems. And so that's what makes me super excited about the work that I do. I think. What the truth is is that I do that work, though, because I spent most of my career as a teacher and an instructional coach and a district leader. And it was always super hard. Like research, my relationship with research in that context was not good, right? It was, <laughs> it just wasn't. It was, um, the research was incredibly opaque. It was difficult to find the thing that was relevant to the problems that the kids and the, and the teachers I was working with cared about. And when I found it, it was hard for me to interpret. I was supposed to you know, read it, understand it, and then turn it into some transformation of practice um, all by myself. And, um, and when I had interactions with researchers, usually I felt like a subject, right? I felt like someone who should, uh, who didn't have questions of my own or theories of my own, but had to get with the program and implement the, you know, the, the strategy with fidelity so someone else could answer their questions, which were usually not that interesting to me <laughs> or the teachers or the young people right. who were all about the business of making learning better. Yeah. Um, and so I get so excited that, that this group is coming together and trying to build the kind of research agenda that could be practically relevant to, te the, to teach teaching that could give us a, a clearer window as practitioners into what really matters in learning, that, that we have to both develop these sets of competencies, but that we also have to understand that learning is social and emotional. And so um, I'm excited to be here. And the morning has been wonderful for the frustrated educator in me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Zoe. Jim. Terrific. Thanks, Bridge. Um, well, let me start by saying it's great to be here. And congratulations to the Council of Distinguished Scientists on this consensus report. It's really important, and I, I'm just going to go off script for a moment here because I was sitting thinking about the question of how research informs um, our organization, our strategy, and, and sort of our day-to-day -day work. And you know, we have we recruit and train uh, you know over 3,000 young adults um, that serve full time in 330 schools, 28 school districts, 28 cities, 40 school districts, including here with Chancellor Wilson. And uh, in many ways, I'm realizing that the uh, the research design team for our whole school whole child services is literally in this room or on the council. I mean, it, it's incredible. You know, our approach around um, whole child and whole school was greatly informed by David Osher's work at AIR. Um, our approach to using early warning indicators um, and selecting the schools that had the highest need is really connected to the research out of the Everyone Graduate Center at Johns Hopkins and the, the uh, Chicago Consortium. Our um, focus on developmental and ex um, Relationships and experiences were informed by so many people in, in this room. Um, our appreciation and understanding of the context of adversity, the Pam Cantor and Turnaround for Children. And I, and I say all that just to um, express my hope that this report will have that kind of catalytic influence on um, organizations that partner with schools and schools themselves to really apply the research in the most effective ways and to become um, learning organizations, which is what we need to do. And it was. It was that approach that led us to create the program that Bridge talked about, Diplomas Now, which um, got one of the early Invest in Innovation Awards and launched a seven-year randomized control trial um, around a school improvement model with Johns Hopkins and Communities and Schools, who I think is also here. Um, and the early results on that are, are really strong in reducing the presence of early warning indicators in key transition years in the secondary grades. 
um, and getting students on track uh, to graduate. And we're just launching another um, initiative uh, supp uh, supported by um, IES um, with MDRC, and Stephanie Jones is going to be involved in that, and AIR. And I think that's really important because the, the, the point I want to um, praise is that if we think that the traditional human capital structure alone um, is going to be able to bring the value of integrated social emotional academic development in a way that um, addresses equity and gets into sort of high adversity schools where large percentages of students um, are facing all kinds of challenges that need to be addressed for them to be able to feel attached, a sense of belonging, meaning, be able to focus. Um, you know, it's going to be a struggle. We're going to, you know, um, the brave and incredible teachers and principals and social workers and health workers and chancellors, they need support from the whole community. And that, and there is a, there's a need for the nonprofit sector to rally around this. And research is the only way to inform that in an efficient and practical way. Otherwise, you end up with, you know, we see this in schools. You could have 20, 30 partners, but is it coherent? Is it evidence-based? Is it structured? Are we getting the right intervention to the right student at the right time? And I think, you know, what research allows us to do and what this report can help accelerate um, is to become smarter and more effective at doing that. Because I, I, I can't stress enough that we're going to need to find um, additional supports um, and um, additional human capital strategies um, that are cost effective, like national service and AmeriCorps. Um, and we're going to need to be able to take young adults that have skills and talent and want to contribute and develop them as practitioners to support teachers, school leaders, families, and students, and really powerfully integrating social, emotional, and academic development in our highest need schools. It's wonderful, Chairman. Your organization is such a model of how you've taken research and evidence and institutionalized it and integrated it in a way where it has, had, it has effects on the ground. So I'm going to become less of the easy substitute teacher and push you a little bit. Um, we're about to release with CASEL a nationally representative survey of principals all across the United States who tell us uh, how fundamental and central uh, social and emotional um, learning and development is to the, to the development of children in an integrated way, and yet they're um, begging for more research and evidence and understanding of uh, the effects so that they can make a stronger case in their schools with their superintendents and principals and teachers uh, for having this emerge in classrooms. So how do we close that gap practically? Zoe, you touched upon it in your remarks. Um, ideas for how we can close the research gap and translate it in ways in schools that will have effects. Well, um, I guess the thing I think about is like the role for funders in that work and for researchers um, is I think we need to recognize what we're up to. It's a big deal what we're doing, right? That 100 years ago, we built an institution called school, and we made it accessible to every young person in our country. But we built it on maybe a deeper sense of what kids should learn you know, the three R's, then how or why kids learn. Like, how kids learn and why they're motivated to learn. And we know so much more now um, than we did 100 years ago. And we're all pretty, um, I think, I, I, I hear a lot of um, frustration with the limitations of that pattern of schooling that we built 100 years ago. So I think what we're up to is building a more collective theory of learning together, one that is deeply evidence-based, that is, that is accurate and represents that learning is social-emotional and that we need to get to social and emotional outcomes for kids. Um, and if, we, if that's what we're up to, then I think for funders and for researchers, it, it calls on a couple things. One is um, we need to recognize that that's a team effort. Um, that it is not about any individual scholar succeeding because they get their construct uh, on the cover of the yeah. New York Times, or uh, they get a best-selling book, or, they, um, or there's a framework that they've advanced that is, that is the, you know, the primary framework. Um, I think we have to recognize that this is a 10 to 30 year endeavor, and that it's going to take many of us working together to kind of move from we have a thin theory of what learning and development is to we have a thick and robust one that the field is 
shares and is, is operating around. Sometimes I think about it like I go back and I look at the early, early models of the human body that underpins the medical profession early on, right? And we were, you know, we knew that disease lived in the blood, but we didn't know, like, but we thought letting blood was a good idea for, right. you know, for, um, for, for addressing health. And over many, 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 many years and lots of scientific discovery, we've built a, a, a stronger theory of how the body works and how we create um, health systems that support healthy, um, healthy and productive lives for folks. And I think that's what we're up to as a field, is we're trying to build a stronger theory of learning together and then have our practice and our policy align with that and support it. And I think to do that, like one, it's going to take less doing things individually and more doing things together. And I think that is true for researchers and the cross-disciplinary kind of work that the CDS has been engaged in. And I think it's true for funders. Like we as funders are a problem in this field as well. Uh, we can tend to want to like stake our claim on a single framework, a way of talking about the work, instead of recognizing that there's a much bigger body of work to be done to advance our common understanding understanding about how learning and development happen and, and have that um, in, you know, inform how we reimagine our school systems. Antoine. Yeah, uh, thank you. Just to build on some of the uh, points that, um, that Zoe made, uh, I often say, uh, as I engage with folks, that excellence can't be achieved alone. And what I'm trying to get at there is that uh, whether you're the teacher in the classroom you're going to, and you want to be successful, uh, you're going to need to uh, involve your students and their families. Um, whether you're the school leader leading a school, you're going to need to distribute, distribute leadership and involve teachers and your staff and your parents, and, um, and you're going to get to the best decisions there. Whether we're a school district um, trying to make sure that we have a collection of really great schools and supporting adults, we're going to need to involve um, those individuals who are doing the work as well as those individuals who care about the success of the work if we're going to be successful. And so I think that's an important piece. But to, to the, and to the question that you just raised, I do think it's worth going back and also building on a point that Zoe made because I don't believe that a lot of educators uh, spend time understanding the purpose of why the institution was developed in the first place. I mean, if you understand that the institution was developed to sort, to, to sort people out and to allow certain numbers of individuals to make it into higher education and others to be prepared for uh, industrial, um, the industrial complex and, and others um, agriculture. If you understand that, then you, then you can buy into the fact that the, the notion that many of the systems that we utilize and, and we, uh, we, we uh, work to protect and we accept as natural ways of doing business are counter to what we need to do now, which is to behave as though we don't have any students to lose. Mm -hmm. And if we are going to behave as though we do not have any students to lose, then it's in our best interest to also behave in a way that helps the adults who spend uh, their time and dedicate their time to helping students succeed understand the best approaches to doing that. And so I don't believe that all of our leaders Although they will say we believe in SEL, mm -hmm. I don't believe all of our leaders and many of our leaders actually understand what that means. Um, I don't believe it in terms of how a lot of the research comes forward that is put in a way that's practical and that speaks to um, the everyday experience of what teachers go through. I mean, I strongly believe that, uh, and this is what we were saying to our, our, our folks in, do the in doing the work, the social emotional academic development, uh, the way we design our professional development. So we've just created an office of, of equity. And I know our team is, you know, uh, we have amazing people on our team and they're thinking about what that looks like. And I said, you know, our, our professional development, the way we train our people, our teachers, our school leaders, all of that needs to be in this office. That we can't have our office of equity, which is leading in our social, emotional, academic development work, fighting for time. All our educators don't have time to think about how to teach math and science and social studies over here. And then over here, think about, well, what does it mean to meet the social, emotional needs of, of students over here? 
And then over here, how to manage classrooms, how to communicate with parents. We need to roll things out and begin to recognize that what we're asking people to do is hard. Break it down to its simplest form, which is one of the reasons why we start with love and how students feel that we're not providing experiences. We're trying to make sure that things land. So we want to make sure the students feel like we're for them. And in order to do that, we want to make sure that our teachers feel like we're for them, which means in order to do that, we need to make sure our leaders feel like the, that, that we're for them. And begin to help them understand that in order to, I don't, I don't believe that we should be talking about how do we not hold people to high expectations. I mean, we, we, have, I, we want kids to learn. I mean, that's the whole point. But we want to help people understand that, and that's one, one of the reasons why I love about the report, in order to reach the ultimate outcomes that we have for students to ensure that they learn, then we need to rethink how we do school. And that's the conversation that we're, we're, we are trying to explore in DC to say that you know, we have some things that are working for us, but they're not working for all of our students all of the time. And if our goal is to position students to positively influence society and thrive in life, which, of course, um, for many students is going to talk about college and career, but others it's going to be about um, uh, volunteerism, entrepreneurism, or starting a nonprofit. If we're going to position that, then we need to think about the experiences there. And if that's the case, then we need to ask our leaders, which, getting back to your question, to re-examine what they understand and believe about how schools should work in the first place and how they should behave in relationship to their teachers and how they support teachers and educators in service of meeting the, the outcomes that we have for, for children. And so that's the work. It's much harder than oftentimes it is laid out in terms of educational standards and uh, uh, academic outcomes. It is about how do we show up in school? How do we show up as leaders? And for me, how do I demonstrate some level of vulnerability and importance in the how being as, as important as what we decide to do as a, as a school system? Mark? Sure. Um, I think the report actually lays it out nicely. I think the um, from the perspective of our center, when we're working with large districts and schools, I think you have to hit people in the heart, and you have to hit them with data, and that you need to go both directions. Um, what I've learned over the last 20 years is that you need to bring people on a journey to help them see the value and importance of this work. So the first, to me, is really clearly explaining why relationships and emotions matter for all kinds of things, decision making, attentional capacity, mental health, creativity, academic performance, and oh wow, there's a lot, there's research that shows that relationships and how people feel drives those things. Yeah, there is, great, <laughs> all right. Next, the people who are wiser in terms of how they deal with their feelings and build relationships and maintain them, they have even better outcomes. Oh really, there's research on that? Yeah, there is, okay great. Then, all right, what are the ways, what are the pathways? What are the, what, how do you implement this in a way? Um, and obviously there are many different approaches to doing that. Our approach is that you have to hit the climate and the skills of each individual simultaneously. Um, just to go back on some of the research, uh, people are talking about principles and how do you get principles to be motivated? Well, we just finished a study with 15,000 people across the United States where we had the emotional skills of their supervisor. And we looked at how do the people who work in those organizations feel each day. And we found a 60% difference in inspiration based on the emotional skills of the leader. So you can imagine, you're in a school with a leader with very low emotional intelligence. You feel inspiration 20 to 25% of the time while you're working. Your leader is high in these skills 75, 80% of the time. I mean, it was remarkable. So when we talk about feelings, right, the moderator oftentimes is the climate and the adult who is running that environment. Same thing went for things like fear of speaking up if I have a problem. Huge differences. I'm not going to speak up to this. They're not going to listen to me. I'm going to have to walk in eggshells. Completely different when they have more developed skills. Yeah. Burnout, purpose and meaning, all these different variables varied significantly as a function of the skills of the leader. So when people see those kinds of findings and they realize, wow, like 
which leader am I? <laughs> um, I think it, ha it opens up a door, and it's a wake-up call. Uh, that, that's really uh, significant. When I asked uh, Russ Rumberger when we first got into the dropout work, you know, what does the evidence tell us about what's actually working? The first thing he cited was teacher and principal self-efficacy, their own belief, and as you say, the um, emotional equipment that comes along with that uh, to hold the expectations, set the goals and purposes, and inspire children uh, to develop and learn. So I think it's really significant. Just one last thing yeah. I want to add to that, which is in this larger study that we just finished with teachers themselves, it's about 8,000 teachers uh, across the United States, what we're finding is that culture and climate of their school right, is driving their feeling states in school, but it's also driving mental health problems, sleep problems, extra drinking in, in the evenings, like very ineffective lifestyle and health habits. So to me, like when you bring those data to schools and districts and say, OK, how do you want your teachers to feel? How do you want the climate to be in your school? It's going to affect the students directly. It's going to affect the health and well-being of your educators and the larger community. So Jim, how will this report uh, help you and City Year close the, the gap between research understanding and implementation in schools? Well, if I could, I just want to build on some of the, the comments because I think um, the way we'll, they, they, the knowledge in the report, I, I think, really just um, further um, cements our belief that we have to be very, that this is very powerful, what we're offering, right? And there's been sort of an explosion in understanding the human and brain development and how kids learn. And you know, we're wrestling with you know, how, to, how to bring that, you know, how to manifest that in a way that benefits helping students meet their potential. And um, you know, there's a risk that we do that in a way that, it, that is ultimately not equitable, right? And so from our perspective, it starts with you know, really recognizing and trying to build awareness that there is a, you know, there's both an implementation and a relationship gap um, that is exasperated in high need schools because they're, they're high performing, high poverty schools. Um, there's effective, we've heard many, many examples, approaches to using developmental relationships and experiences to help children meet their potential. Um, but that is not always the case in those schools. And I think it starts with um, what we heard up here around leadership and mindset. We're hearing what's happening in DC, philanthropic you know, influence is, is important. But I think we also have to step back and really um, sort of deeply empathize with the role of, of teachers, for example, and others. And recognize that before we, um, you know, sort of bring that there's a whole new approach. And I think there was a lot of honesty on the previous panel, recognizing that there, it may require everyone to work harder to make this change. Everyone, teachers, students, families. Um, I think we need to also say, what's the role? You know, are these schools organized, designed, and resourced to enable that? And I think that's that we have to um, continue to do research and try to influence policy that creates the conditions to say, how, how should a school be organized and designed that enables teachers, school leaders, partners, Right, to both close gaps of individual students, but also to really affect the, the student culture and the adult culture that, that will ultimately create the conditions that, that the power of seed can be um, realized by everyone. So Stephanie and Jennifer and this group has put together an extraordinary report on the state of the evidence. Let's flip the proposition for a moment. And I look out and I see people like Pam Cantor turn around and. Roger and Karen with the CDI in so many districts across the United States. And there's so much innovation and experimentation, and we can't even define the terms in terms of there's just an explosion of, of, of uh, work in these, in these uh, different areas. So how do we actually translate that in, in, into informing what Stephanie and others and the, the research agenda needs to uncover? What haven't we figured out yet? Uh, in terms of uh, research that would strengthen uh, the ability to, to work on the ground. Mark? Well, we're going to spend a whole day on that tomorrow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Stay tuned. Um, um, that's a big question, you, yeah. know, uh, you know, coming at it, I think, from multiple, there's so many lenses from which we need, you know, to think um, in terms of the research from the individual level to the relationship level to the context or school level. Um, and I think what we're going to try to focus on over the next day is, is just thinking about the, the frameworks and the benchmarks kind of work that needs to be done to understand the trajectory of these skills, 
Um, we need to think about the implementation um, factors that Stephanie brought up earlier, the mechanisms by which these things work. So we oftentimes have these experiments where we randomly assign, you get this, you get that, or you get nothing, and then you get an outcome, and it's like, okay, so what actually happened? Did they learn the skills, or are they just, we don't know specifically what's the pathway towards um, you know, the development or the outcome. So by way of example, um, if you're doing an intervention where you're teaching students how to be more self-regulated or co-regulated, when you, are they developing, is the, is the development of that skill related to the outcome? Um, so I think there's, you know, from program implementation to better trials to the, what I think is for our work most critically important, which is what are the formative assessments that are gonna support the implementation of this work? Because what teachers really need is there's a feedback loop in terms of am I doing something that is making a difference and yeah. are my students meeting goals uh, in this area? I'll just stop there. But I guess I would, I would yeah. just say, I love, it's like I loved this, I have to say. I was like nodding my head and admitting. <laughs> and, and I think you're kind of going through, like, these are, the, these are the key areas where we just need to focus on a lot more research. If we're going to get practically relevant uh, evidence to the people who are reimagining schools and systems to really serve many more kids better, I think that's absolutely right. And I would, I would say there might also be something you as scholars can be thinking about around the infrastructure that's missing, that that's not your everyday business. You know what I mean? Like, I think that the truth is, is that um, these are not conversations we have enough in the academy. It wasn't organized to solve the problem of our school system, you know? Um, we have lots of breakdowns in, in just the way the infrastructure that incentivizes research actually asks scholars to pick up important questions of practice. Um, and it's amazing to see a group of scholars do it, but I know they're doing it kind of like on their free time, right? It's, yeah. not, what, um, it's not what they're incentivized for in the institution itself. Well, with funding, that could be changed. But yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and, 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 you know, that's why we fund what we fund, and yet, <laughs> we'll I, yeah, outcomes. right, yeah, I, you know, that's why I we mean, fund what we fund. Transparency is open. Yeah, but I also think it's like, you know, I, I think about the fact that in many institutions where we've talked a lot about teacher prep would have to change. Well, where does teacher prep happen? In schools of education. Where does the study of learning happen? In schools of psychology. When do those two things actually come together to say, you know, what's a better way to prepare teachers? Like, we've just got infrastructure problems that I think you as scholars can also give the field some feedback on to say, if you know, if we really want a, a sector that is informed by a stronger theory of learning, these are the, you know, this is what would help us to do the research that is practically relevant to all the people who are working in the field. Other comments, Antoine or Jim, before we open it up? I'll just give a, a, a good example of um, how um, research philanthropy and sort of on the ground implementation can um, create useful tools, and that's that we. Um, we had the opportunity to partner with the U.S. Department of Education, uh, Mentor, and the Riggs Foundation to, and PERTS out of Stanford, on the research end, to um, support the implementation and testing of a growth mindset toolkit um, that can be used by um, um, teachers, but also practitioners and, and other organizations. And uh, over a two-year period, it was uh, really profound, and it helped our it helped our core members understand their own growth mindset, so that they were in a position with the relationships they have with the students they're working with to help them build their growth mindset. And obviously that can be applied to teachers and it's just a good example of, of we're scaled, we, that's now scaled across 28 cities. Two years, fairly low cost, good tool, but it was the right combination of you know, research, philanthropy, the government, and implementation partners. That's terrific. Questions from the audience? Itai. Uh, hi everyone. Um, Itai uh, from the Einhorn Family Charitable Trust. Um, I, I'm curious just to follow up on this last string of conversation and, and to the chancellor. So you have created a mission statement with your community and, and that advances or, or creates the framework, the environment to advance this sort of work. And you made a comment that you're not sure many 
education leaders actually sort of understand what it is and sort of what it means. And Zoe was sort of sharing her frustration. Bridge, you referenced an upcoming principal uh, survey you all are going to release. I guess I'm curious from a, from a district perspective, what research would be helpful for decision making, sort of for the, for the ability to, is it to spend more resources, is it to allocate more time, and then what research would be helpful to actually support high quality implementation once you've sort of made that decision? Because, and I, just the quick motivation for that question is, my concern is that the philanthropic sector and the government, right, which spends much more than philanthropy does on research, to Zoe's point, we're actually spending it in the wrong places that aren't necessarily going to enable this to spread across the country. Yeah, um, thank you for the uh, thank you for the question. You know, I, I think um, the research based on the why um, this is important and, and how we learn. I think this is a this is this is the right first step, right? I mean, people need to understand that. I mean, there we have educators, teachers, principals, those who support them who. Who, who didn't get any real grounding in human development, um, and uh, therefore the, the strategies they, they, they are using um, are perfectly logical considering the support that they've received. And so I think understanding that, that, that how, the, how this work um, is uh, supportive of what they're trying to get done and why um, spending more time learning how to get better at it is worth their time, is helpful. What it does for us um, as we connect uh, the vision to our mission is it begins to help them see that, you know, we're not just making this up. This isn't, this isn't something that Antoine thinks is really important <laughs> or a few folks centrally. It is to say that, no, we're really interested in helping you succeed, and um, these are some things that that uh, have been proven to make a difference in terms of helping students learn. And I will say that as we've been sharing some of this uh, work, I do faculty meetings, I just had one last night uh, at schools, and we begin, I begin to share this. I mean, there's a lot of hallelujahs out there. So they, the teachers are <laughs> like, uh, you know, um, this is important, we, we knew something was missing, or we had some who were doing the work and saying, I've been waiting for people to pay attention and listen, we've been trying to get attention on this more, so I think that's part of it. But in terms of the second part of the question, um, you know, it's something I say to principals quite a bit when I'm working with them, and I, I drop in um, to their school, and that is that, you know, people are gonna believe what they can uh, see, hear, and feel, okay? So we have to make sure that we can make the work that is happening um, in, 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 in various classrooms and in schools, and the specific moves that people are making to have success with students, regardless of what the, where the students are, how the students are situated in life, I think as many different examples as possible, um, urban, rural, uh, middle class, affluent, um, highly traumatic situations, whatever the case may be, and give people examples where they can see what success looks like when this is implemented well, where they can understand what types of uh, what types of language are, 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 are we hearing? Um, what are students saying? What are teachers saying? Um, what types of uh, language um, is communicated? And by language, I mean both the oral and written um, that we see um, in, in schools from school leaders, from the district level, um, when this is working well. And then what, when we talk about SEL being integrated well, so I mentioned Ketchum, I can mention Ketchum Elementary School here. Um, in DC or Patterson Elementary School or HD Cook Elementary School, which um, two of them are using the second step and, and, and uh, um, uh, one responsive classroom where they are integrating the, uh, the uh, related service providers and supporting classroom instruction um, with teachers. What they're working on is feel. And all, what I'm finding is our teachers who and our principals in other schools who are not in that context, who can't see it, they don't know what it looks like, sounds like, and feels like when they are, when, the, when, when, when this is working well. And I think uh, as many, as much as we can spend time in research, uh, making that more transparent and finding examples where it is working. And then finally, and this was mentioned earlier, so I don't want to make it sound like I've come up with something revolutionary, but people didn't learn by doing. I mean, we can talk about doing the work 
all day long. People actually have to practice doing the work, be in uh, communities of practice where they can give, give feedback, um, share ideas about what's working, make some mistakes, fall forward, so on and so forth, and, uh, and then iterate and get back to it. And so I think that that's the, 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 the piece that we uh, think is important. I'm interested in that. And then partnership is really important as well. So who are partners that um, have, uh, that, that get this work? Um, what are they really great at? And then how do we then begin to match partners up at the district level, uh, city level, and then in classrooms um, so, that, uh, so that people aren't trying to do this by themselves? Mark. I just want to add on to that. I think this issue of structure is, is super important because in these larger districts, especially urban districts, where teachers come on the day before school starts, and in New York City there's November 4th and there's June, June 20th, and they see each other maybe once a month for you know a couple hours, if that. And if what we're doing is saying that we're trying to preserve what it means to be a human, right, to be in relationship, then we need to give people opportunity to be in relationship and do exactly what you're saying is, you know, try a, try a technique in the classroom and does it work, does it not work? Get feedback on that. Um, you may be able to learn how to meditate with an app, but um, I don't think you can learn necessarily how to build positive relationships through technology, right? You have to be in the world doing it. Yeah. And, um, and unfortunately, you know, the, the number one um, setback that we have with our work, because it requires so much training for the adults, because a primary piece of our work is, is the professional development for the adults to learn and practice the skills, is that there's zero time and opportunities for that. So um, I think that's where the uh, opportunity is for building those schools where, you know, last thing I want to say is that, you know, our work is in a couple hundred private schools around the nation and around the world and 1,000 or 1,500 public schools. And I say, why, does it, why do the private schools have an easier time? And it's for very obvious reasons, right? They have a lot more time and flexibility to do the work than the public schools do. Very good. Yes, behind the Oscar. <laughs> behind, behind, behind the, the column. column. Oscar Barber in African American Studies and Psychology at the University of Maryland. I have a question that really has to do with the systems and, um, and impediments that uh, school superintendents and the philanthropic uh, segment have. So as a researcher, we have the naive view that superintendents are little emperors so that they could just mandate things. Um, I know in reality that's not the case, but it would be useful. <laughs> it would be useful to know what are the kinds of impediments, obstacles, processes you have to do. So you've made a decision that uh, socio-emotional and academic are, are, are things, the priority. What are the things you have to go through, and how can we be of service in, in helping? And the same thing for the philanthropic organizations. Uh, to, what are the kinds of things you, if you've decided as an individual uh, that this is a priority, uh, what are the kinds of constraints and systems that you have to try to implement your vision? Yeah, I smile uh, when I think about the emperor piece. I think that uh, it's uh, one of the things that uh, you know, I, I'm in meetings and, 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 and people will say, well, you know, you, you, you guys just do this, 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 and this. And I'm smiling because it's almost as if it's being discussed as if we turn on the light switch and everyone says, oh, you said it, we'll do it. Um, <laughs> but uh, it also is an appreciation and recognition that, you know, um, what it takes to get people to uh, do the work that needs to be done. So one is ownership. So our, our work is about, I mean, the way I'm trying to approach it is how do we create a shared sense of ownership in the work? So that we can move, we can move forward um, um, together. So I think, you know, from that standpoint, uh, I think it's a good thing that we all have to um, go through the types of things that it takes to move people, which is um, actually spending time with people and hearing their ideas and exposing them to the same information that we have. And my experience is that people tend to arrive at similar similar answers when when, when we're given that opportunity. But in terms of uh, helping remove barriers, I mean, I think a lot of it is trying to peel back the onion and help people understand um, what, it, what it takes. I mean, so when we talk about learning um, is um, a, a, a construct of social, emotional, and academic uh, development, and all of those things working together in, in its truest sense. I mean, I, look, uh, policymakers need to understand that. 
And, um, you know, I think uh, philanthropists need to understand that and think about that and understand, and understand that. I think we need to create and, and think about what does it take to create environments where risk within education is something that we understand is there and we have to position people to be willing to take some, which means that um, um, we have to rethink uh, some of our uh, approaches. And, um, you know, I think that we have to think about funding at, at you know I, I there are a lot of philanthropy out there that's that's supporting and I look at it as is a lot of it's disconnected um, so funding a lot of different things in schools as opposed to going deep and really trying to encourage a really thought out integrated approach that actually has an impact on what happens in the in the classroom um, and so how do we simplify some of the uh, thou shalls that are coming to school? Thou shall do these things. And, and they're, they're really approaches that we're saying uh, that have been identified as kind of like magical elixirs that if we just do this. And so there are a lot of those approaches. Trying to move those out of the way and get down to what does it take to really help young people um, learn and for people who are interested in young people learning, helping them be successful. I think if we can get people to focus on understanding that, then um, we move away from trying to uh, require all schools to be one thing for all kids, which is kind of the way policy rolls out. So, yeah, the other gosh, half? I, I have to answer for the field of education <laughs> philanthropy and all of our ills. That's uh, it's okay. Uh, um, Counseling yeah. is available after. I mean, I think that this is it. This is totally right. Antoine's experience of the thou shalls and the shoulds and the you know thirty different. Uh, reform agendas that are underneath the hood, largely overlapping and similar things, all under a different flag, right? That is that comes from a different foundation or a different form, a different source of funding. Um, I think that we need to stop funding that way. And I, I love that I get to work with lots of funders who think that too. Um, and I think that's part of what th this uh, commission is about, right? Which is what. What would it look like if we were to say, you know, what we all want is to build the equitable education system that all of our kids and our country needs and deserves? That's what we all want to do, right? Universally. We might call it different things. We should stop doing that, right? Like, universally, that's what we're up to. And what if we got really smart people who know about learning and development to come together in this forum and say what they know? And what if we got really smart people who understand practice and have led districts and managed the political change and the organizational change that it takes to come together and say what, what they need and what they're doing? And what if we got policymakers to listen to all of that more than they gave new ideas, probably? Um, and funders to listen to that and, and stop thinking up the shalls and shoulds and start um, listening. So I hope, I hope that's a little bit of what we're doing here and in other parts of the field. You know, the only thing I want to be firm on in my work at Rakes and our team's work and the thing that I try to align with our board and our trustees on is that our aim is an equitable and responsive education system. Mm -hmm. Our, our, like, our fuel is learning more about how learning and development happens and helping the field learn about that too. And our methods are continuous improvement and recognizing that we can get better at getting better at using data in new ways and, and helping the field learn how to do that. I don't want to call it anything, and I don't want to, you know, I just, I want to go to the places in the field where people are about doing that work and then support it. And, um, and I think there's a growing group of funders and philanthropists who see that as the, you know, more and more are aligned around that being their role. But um, I think it's true. We create our own problems as funders. We look out at the field and we can say, oh, it's so faddish, and people are jumping from one topic to another, and there's like initiative fatigue, and it's like we got to paint ourselves into that picture. Um, and I'd say researchers in your meetings tomorrow, I would invite you to do the same thing. Um, you know, I think as researchers, I've been in a lot of conversations with researchers where they have critiques of the education field and how they use the knowledge that's being built. But 
we all need to paint ourselves into the picture. We, we make those contributions as well to the, um, to the way this sector is organized and the way it uses knowledge and, and organizes itself to do what we all want to do, which is help every kid you know, be prepared for a, a thriving life. I think you represented education philanthropy very well. Well done. Here, here. Uh, anyway, time, for, time for one more question, because I want to give each panelist a, a chance to give some closing thoughts. Yes. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm Trish Cummins. I'm currently a graduate student in educational transformation in the newly launched program at Georgetown. But prior to that, I did an eight-year stint on my local school board, which is arguably one of the impediments that <laughs> you talked about. And that is my question, is um, uh, an action plan for how you reach those policymakers, because I can think of dozens of policy decisions that we make at the local level that can negatively or positively impact SEL, much yeah. more than the federal or state level. We're making them in professional development and decisions about co-curriculars. I appreciated the conversation earlier about shifting the focus away from the economic to peace, but I will tell you that in my years on the school board, the number of school board members that are inspired by that vision versus the economic reality. And so you can have an amazing superintendent that comes in and is trying to redistribute resources, and you've got people that aren't in this room that are they want to know why? They're not going to, you know, they can have a conversation about a new math curriculum, but you start talking about putting professional development in place or shifting resources to have um, more SEL resources, and they're going to shut down that leader. Yeah. So, um, again, I think that there's so much that happens at the local level, especially now with ESSA, where you've got local policymakers who can really help push this work forward. And I just wonder what your approaches are for. Um, addressing them. Good. Antoine? Who's going to take that on? <laughs> yeah. Good luck, Antoine. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I just note that um, um, I no longer have a school board, so. Uh, <laughs> That's why Antoine's that, in D.C. I would not say that. I would uh, point out that is not a uh, small coincidence. Um, I, I, I will say, look, you know, I think that all reform is local. I was talking to someone a couple weeks ago, and, you know, reform is local in terms of the biggest impact that it's gonna, gonna make. And so, you know, I think you have to get in to where, um, to where, uh, where it have this conversation in ways that resonates with people in a local level. For me, it's not about the acronym or, 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 or the language. It really is about the science and the practice and the supports that need to be put in place. And so if we can begin to help people understand those conversations and, and begin to think about what that could look like depending upon what their role is, then they can grab a hold to it. If it's a package that um, um, we are saying, you know, it's another, if, where it comes across as feeling like another do this, and it be feeling as though it's imposed, and people's natural inclination is to, is to push against it. I mean, school boards, they, uh, many of them, I mean, they're, they're, they're elected, most of them, and so they have to be able to go out into the community and be able to explain what it is that they're trying to get done uh, in schools and uh, how they're spending resources. And if in any way it feels like something is to benefit one group of students at the expense of other groups of students, then you know, I think naturally their antennas are gonna go up around that. And so I think that the more we help people understand that this is work that benefits all students, um, the more that we can talk about this work is what we do. I mean, all school boards have to figure out how to allocate dollars and resources to, to develop educators. And so the more that this becomes a means in which we develop educators, um, work they're going to have to do anyway. Um, in terms of hiring um, staff, it, if we can make it about how does this fit into that work and, 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 and uh, um, what that looks like, then it becomes a part of the natural business that school boards have to do, uh, districts have to do anyway, as opposed to feeling like it's a package that they are having imposed. Um, upon them. And then I do think leadership matters, so we're really trying to encourage the school boards to lean into um, uh, identifying leaders that really can uh, champion this work for them, um, and then trusting those leaders to, um, to be partners with them to move the work forward. I mean, you can't, I think it's kind of hard to 
get someone who is really super skeptical and then trying to train them this way, um, and then learning uh, the, the hard lesson after the fact. I mean, they can be proactive on the front end. Your question's a wonderful segue to our closing. Tim had the insight at the beginning. Most, most commissions gather together extraordinary leaders from the country and then issues these, these reports to the nation on what the nation ought to do. And Tim had the insight that why don't we have a report from the nation and why don't we build from the ground up and engage scientists and teachers and students and principals and superintendents and nonprofit leaders and philanthropists and policymakers in uh, an effort that would create a sense of shared ownership. So I just would like to give uh, the panelists uh, an opportunity to share any final insights on the topic of this uh, panel, which is what would you love to see in this report from the nation that accelerates and informs uh, the extraordinary work that Stephanie has led and these 28 distinguished scientists are going to struggle with the next couple of days? What kind of recommendations or insights would you share as it relates to the research agenda? Jim. Um, I, th I think this is, I think I'm listening to you. Uh, I guess one thing I have is, is a bit of a research, research challenge for the brilliance in this, in this room, which is that if, if it's true that we believe that um, the importance of developmental relationships and experiences, and if it's also true that we believe that um, to create a positive developmental relationship, it does take a certain amount of time and nurturing, and if it's also true that our educators are really strapped for time, and that's a huge pressure that we heard about today, how, how do we measure at the schoolhouse level what the gap is? Because it's hard to address it if we have no common way of measuring that. An average secondary school teacher has probably 125, 150 students in their class every day. Is that feasible, that that, that, that teacher is supposed to be the positive developmental relationship? I, I don't know, but we, we need some way. And I just think the brilliance in this room might bring about a way that we could measure that and know that so that we could all work on it um, together. And then my wish for the report um, it's, it's focused on you know, K to 12, yeah. but social emotional development doesn't end when you're 17 or 18. And when I think of Tim's comments that opened up about the summer we just had, um, I think we should, we should recognize that if we had a culture and policies that supported um, everyone doing a year of service on teams from different socioeconomic backgrounds and service to something larger than themselves. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 I mean, if we think where our teachers and leaders are coming from yeah. and who's going to carry this movement forward, right. um, that is a powerful developmental experience for young adults. Um, and it can really transform the country. And I think um, just an acknowledgement that this great work can, can go up the ladder you yeah. know, to, to young adulthood and have an impact beyond K to 12. I, I, um, I'm a, such a plus one on the, the draft of the report. I think the, the priorities it outlines are really strong. And I think my encouragement to the, to the CDS is just to paint yourself into the picture, too, to think about how would the culture among researchers, among scientists studying learning and development, um, how would it need to change? Uh, what's limiting you from doing this work today? And help us understand that. And I'd point to a couple of things. I think the incentives, the infrastructure around how we build learning, how we connect it to problems of practice is broken in our field. And we could all be doing more to, to build it to be a stronger thing, one that we can use better. I also think the diversity and the sense of inclusion among who we advance as researchers, who um, who we recruit into to, to answer these, ask these questions and answer it, it needs to be as reflective as the lived experience of the kids who come to our classrooms and the teachers who make them po possible. And I think there's more we could do to make sure that you know, we have that kind of diversity among the researchers that do this work and that, um, and that we're asking those folks to ask the right questions. Um, so those would be my two things to, to paint yourself into this picture. Those are great, Mark. Um, based on this conversation, I'm thinking I would like the research that would eliminate superintendents asking me, can you find me the money to do this? <laughs> uh, and I'm not joking about that. I think it's a serious challenge for implementation of this work. And um, I'd also like the research which shows that every superintendent should have an assistant superintendent of social and emotional economic development that supports this work so that there is a permanent um, person responsible for um, the implementation and integration of this work. Terrific. 
Antoine, final word. Yeah, on that note, um, we welcomed uh, um, Dr. Wander Legrand last week, uh, Deputy Chancellor for Social and Social Academic Development, into DC to work with our team, and so we're really excited about that. Um, just a couple thoughts. One is, I think it's really important as we talk about the work that we don't allow it to be talked about in, 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 in narrow terms. And so, um, it, you know, I just appreciate the point around it benefits all of our students and it benefits our adults as well. So really trying to make sure that the research is quite clear around that and the why, that we don't allow it to be narrow. And then the other piece is that if we believe that this work is extremely transformative, we want it to transform the way we do school, then we want to make sure that we're not allowing it to be spoken about in terms of um, whether or not we can, uh, it, we should be focusing on high academic outcomes in, in, in student achievement or something else. Um, students should, we, we need them to perform academically. And they can perform academically. This is deeply personal for me. Many of the things that I hear uh, people talk about as relates to students experiencing, I experienced them, uh, moved all the time, single parent, teenage mother, 10 schools, 13 years, 15 different homes, saw the violence, the drugs, the alcoholism, all of that, experienced it, including the violence, and yet I was able to figure it out. Why? Because I learned. Who, why did I learn? Great teachers, um, high expectations, so on and so forth, and uh, the, the system, uh, my mother being able to navigate the system. So I say that to say we want to make sure that we're uh, using research to expand what we accept as evidence of student learning mm -hmm. um, and, and really trying to push that. Academic outcomes are one aspect of it, but students being able to demonstrate other markers of, uh, of learning and us accepting that as important, I think that's our opportunity. Wonderful. I think one of you said it so compellingly of uh, creating environments where students want to come to school to learn, teachers want to teach, principals and superintendents want to lead, and parents want to drop off their kids. So on that note, <laughs> thank this extraordinary panel. <laughs> Thank you.